Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is nuclear powers. So we're kicking off this unit on nuclear proliferation, and I think the sensible place to start is by asking, who has nukes? So we're going to go in order of when states first acquired nuclear weapons and talk briefly about why they did that. And we kick things off with the United States in 1945. So this is during World War II. A bunch of nuclear scientists had written the president of the United States saying, hey, there's this possibility we might be able to develop a very strong and powerful weapon, which would be useful to defeat Nazi Germany and Japan. And it would probably be better if we developed this weapon before the Nazis did. And so the United States funnels a ton of money into this project. And ultimately, it yields a couple of bombs before the end of the war. And the United States launches a couple of bombs, uh, first in Hiroshima and then in Nagasaki, which level both of those cities and compel the, the Japanese to surrender, ultimately. And I make this note here that this would have been a lot worse had the Nazis actually got into it first. But there's a reason that the Nazis had a harder time developing nuclear weapons than we did. And that's because there was this huge brain drain from Eastern Europe and Germany into the United States. So as Hitler was coming to power, a bunch of really smart guys in Eastern Europe and Germany, including Albert Einstein, realized that it's probably not a good idea for them to stick around and wait for Hitler to come to power. And so they left that region and came over to the United States and helped out the United States develop a nuclear weapon. So the moral of the story is if, is if you're going to be an evil dictator and you are going to want to stay an evil dictator and win wars, it's probably best not to piss off your scientists and to actually be on the sides of your scientists so that your scientists stay and don't develop the weapon that ultimately defeats your alliance. Now, the next proliferator it was four years later. It was the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union was on the Allies' side during World War II. They were on the United States' side, but they were cunning, and they knew that, hey, after this war is over, we're probably not going to be on good terms with the United States. So they had spies in the United States, including inside the Manhattan Project. And so the Soviet Union gets a lot of technological information from the United States' hard effort into developing nuclear weapons. And so this allows the Soviet Union to, to be able to produce a, a bomb very quickly after the United States produced their first bomb. Now, the United States knew that the Soviet Union was planning on developing a nuclear weapon, but ultimately the U.S. decided not to launch preventative war for a couple of reasons. First, you note that 1949 is immediately after World War II, so the United States was suffering from a bout of war exhaustion and wasn't really eager to start another massive war immediately following the end of the world's largest war. And there was also a problem with intelligence where Whereas the Soviet Union had spies in the United States, the United States had nobody on the ground in the Soviet Union. So there wasn't any possibility of a surgical, uh, sur a surgical strike on the Soviet's nuclear program. It would instead have to take the form of a large-scale invasion, which again, wasn't going to happen immediately after World War II. And once the Soviet Union gets nuclear weapons, this starts the Cold War in earnest. Three years later, the United Kingdom gets their first bomb. Their program was called Tube Alloys, and I'd like to make this distinction because if you think about Manhattan Project versus Tube Alloys, Manhattan Project immediately sounds suspicious. United Kingdom, the English, much better at creating these names that sound so boring that you'd want to know nothing about them. If you heard the, the name Tube Alloys, you would imme be immediately convinced that this is just some boring industrial project and you want to know nothing about it. So the United Kingdom, they get an award for having creative names. United States with Manhattan Project, that's too obvious. Now, the United Kingdom got a lot of their information from the Manhattan Project through an agreement with the United States. So during World War II, the United Kingdom is getting firebombed by Germany. The United Kingdom decides it's probably not such a great idea to keep the nuclear program within the United Kingdom. And so they ship all of the scientists and the technology from the United Kingdom over to the United States, and they collaborate on the Manhattan Project. And the agreement is that whatever the United States finds, the United Kingdom gets. So seven years later, after the United States gets their first bomb in 1945, the United Kingdom has ready, ready access to all of that and develops their own weapon in 1952. Eight years later, France becomes the fourth nuclear power. People often forget that during the Cold War, the United States and the rest of NATO and, and the United Kingdom didn't have the greatest relationship with France, and at one point France had pulled out of NATO. And so around this time, France is seeking strategic independence and wants to be able to possibly avoid uh, getting involved in a war between the United States and the Soviet Union. And so to get this strategic independence, they develop their own nuclear deterrent. 
four years later, China gets their first bomb, and I have no neat stories to talk about this, so we're going to skip this one over and head directly uh, a decade later into India. So India, as you probably know, has an ongoing rivalry with Pakistan. And in 1974, they tested what they called the Smiling Buddha, which is their prototype nuclear weapon. And they refer to this as a peaceful nuclear explosion. And again, this was in 1974. But their program remains dormant for 24 years until we get into 1998. And I want you to hold that thought for a moment. Now, the next proliferator was five years later, and this was Israel. I have the bullet point that Israel does not have nuclear weapons because if you ever hear an Israeli official talking about the nuclear program, or rather being asked about their nuclear program, the response is, we have no idea what you're talking about. We don't have nuclear weapons. What is this nuclear program that you speak of? This is the world's worst kept secret. The Israelis definitely have a nuclear weapon, and they've had nuclear weapons since 1979. Now, something that everyone forgets, South Africa had nuclear weapons. And South Africa in 1979, there was a a satellite the United States had called the Vela Hotel. And this Vela Hotel satellite is just orbiting Earth and, and taking information in, and it sees a flash over the Atlantic Ocean, uh, between where South Africa and Antarctica are. And what we believe, and we still don't really have official confirmation on this, is that this was a test conducted between Israel and South Africa. They were collaborating here uh, to test a nuclear weapon. And so South Africa gets a nuclear weapon about the same time Israel does. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, why on earth did South Africa get a nuclear weapon? As it turns out, there was a civil war going on in Angola at the time involving a communist force that was being helped out by Cuba. Cuba was was helping out, yes, Cuba, all the way from from the where North America is, sent troops over to Africa, into Angola, to help out this communist takeover. South Africa was worried that the civil war would spill over into South Africa. And so they got a nuclear weapon because they wanted to essentially make sure that if there was a crisis, they could be like, hey, look, we have a nuclear weapon. There's a civil war coming over and they're communists. Western allies, you really need to help us out here. Otherwise, there's going to be a big disaster. South Africa is also noteworthy because it's the only country that has had a nuclear weapon, but no longer has a nuclear weapon. The nuclear weapons were dismantled at the end of the apartheid. Fast forwarding actually quite a few years, this is a couple decades now. India and Pakistan have a flare up. There's in fact a war in 1999 between the two countries. And in 1998, as a prelude to the war, as they're trying to show off and, and demonstrate how tough they are, India tests another bomb in 1998. And in response, five weeks later, Pakistan tests six bombs on their own. Now, this has created problems today because Pakistan is too nuclear to fail. Right, we have to be worried about Pakistan, Pakistan's regime surviving. Because if there is regime change in Pakistan and it's sudden, then goodness knows where the nuclear weapons are going to go. Now, Pakistan is noteworthy for another reason because they have this rogue nuclear scientist named A.Q. Khan who has been going around trying to sell nuclear weapons on the black market. So, if you ever hear about him in the news, that's who that guy is. Now, the most recent, and this has been in the news actually very recently, is North Korea. North Korea conducts a couple of really bad nuclear explosions in 2006, 2009, and 2013. The 2013 happened just a couple of weeks ago. And while these bombs have been fairly awful, Seoul is a very packed city. It's very populous, and it's got a a very large population density, and it's right over the border from North Korea. And so if we're worried about just a single bomb here, a single bomb could do a heck of a lot of damage in Seoul, especially it's in the more populous centers, if the the bomb would be targeted in the most populous centers of Seoul. At one point, just uh, about a year ago, North Korea had agreed to trade us their bombs for about a billion pounds of food. But in the meantime, North Korea has, again, tested another bomb in 2013 and also started testing long-range missiles, which was supposed to be something they were going to give up in the agreement to get the billion pounds of food. So who knows where that's going? And of course, Iran is ongoing. Who knows what's going to happen there? So uh, to conclude this video, all of these nuclear powers leads to a couple of questions. There's a macro side of things and a micro side of things. The macro side of things is, you know, we have all these countries with nuclear weapons. What does that do about the world? How does it affect the world system? How does it promote peace? How does it promote war? Uh, What happened during the Cold War? Why did the Cold War end up being peaceful? Was it because of nuclear weapons? So that's the first half of what we're going to be studying in this unit. And the second half of what we're going to be studying in this unit is talking about the micro foundations for why states want to acquire nuclear weapons and what we can do in the United States to stop it and how best to handle North Korea and Iran today. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you next time. Take care.